thank you. Yeah, we need some. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, as you can see, the, the, we will call this this speech uh, disruptive technology for affordable housing. Um, so, first thing to understand is what disruption means or what affordable means. So the the whole thing is that architecture uh, needs technology. Was a, a, a good definition of architecture that my granddad. Uh, learned from Gaudi was or is that architecture is an intelligent uh, combination of technology, economy, and geometry. Okay, so I will try to give you a very, sh very fast 10 minutes uh, uh, history of architecture so we can talk about technology later. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, the car is a, is a very, a very old invent, it's 5,000 years old or more, but uh, it needed a serious disruption which was taking the horse away, okay, taking the horse out. And then Mr. Daimler did it in 19, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't remember the year exactly, but the thing is, he thought, let's take the, the horses out of it, okay? Another big disruptor was, was uh, Gutenberg, who he said, no more handwriting print, print uh, copies, okay? He decided to change that, okay? Another disruptor was Antonio Gaudí, who said, no more Euclidean geometry, so no more, you know, cubes or cylinders or prismas. He wanted to, to go to the next level of geometry, which is the fourth degree geometry, okay? You can, you can really get uh, 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 that kind of curves using straight lines. And this is what he did. But... Um, well, I, I have a, a picture to show it better, so that you know that you use the cone, and then the cone uh, will have different four different sections, and you get the circle, the hyperbola, the ellipse, and the parabola. But the important thing is that he, here we have another disruptor, no? Alvaro Alto, another architect. He said, "No more heavy stuff, no, no more heavy furniture." Okay, and another one, another example is Steve Wozniak, who he said, "No more computers, only for corporations." But Disruptors are not enough, okay? So you need anything or so something else in order to make great inventions affordable, okay? So you have the guys that I call the implementers. For example, from Dyler's, you know, invention, you got Henry Ford that decided to really make this thing affordable. And then he had a formula to make it affordable, which is one platform and three models. And then he could really make cars affordable for people. Because if not, you know, disruptors make things that are great, but are only for the happy few, kings or very rich people, whatever. Mr. Uh, Kampart did, uh, take, took the, the very expensive furniture that Alvar Auto designed. You know, I, I still remember my father also even had a, a heart attack when my mom co bought a couple of chairs from Alto, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And then you can have almost the same chair for nothing now in IKEA, okay? So he's another a big implementer. And then you have Wozniak, you know, creating the personal computer, but Steve Jobs making real things affordable and, and practical. Okay, so now let's talk about my granddad, who was another implementer. Now, you know, he, he was a, a disciple of Antoni Gaudí, and Antoni Gaudí, uh, as I said to you, stopped using uh, Euclidean geometry to go to uh, the, the fourth degree geometry. And then what my granddad did was he took the brick to the limit. So instead of using only stone, he took brick, you know, squeezing it as much as possible in order to get affordable buildings, affordable industrial buildings, in order to get, you know, uh, wine cellars and well, in agricultural uh, buildings all over the country. Okay, so. Talking about my granddad, I have a personal story here, which is, this is a building, which is a, a Tarragona Aqueduct, built uh, 22 centuries ago. And uh, when we were, we, had a ha we have a, a house nearby, and, and he stopped one day and said to me, and when I was 15, I said to me, let's take a look to this, because f you, you have to realize that since then, we have learned anything else, okay? We, we have learned very little things. And that 
that thing from my grand, he died a, a few months later, and I, I was really shocked about that thing for all my life, okay? So I am now going to go to, through the a very quick history of architecture, but let's remember that image because we will go back to later on. So that's the 60,000 years ago, we, we got a dolmen. The dolmen is really architecture, okay? And if you really see, if you, if you, if you t take a look to the image, you can see that there is a nice combination between, ma between mass and void. And this is, the, f to me, this is the whole story about architecture. So it's, it's the, con the, the, the continuous fight between void against mass, okay? So 50,000 years later, you get this, <laughs> which is a, is a Mesopotamian ziggurat. And, and this, as you can see, there is no void here. It's, uh, it's just a mass of stones. The, the Egyptians did something similar with a little bit more of void, okay? You see, so they're, they big, big columns and a little space between them. Uh, obviously, the roof was dark and, and you couldn't see nothing. The Greeks made it better, so they got more void and a little bit less of mass. But then the Romans mastered the void. Okay? The Romans make a breakdown in, 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 the, you know, in, in, in this, the construction technology of stone construction technology because they really mastered the void. They had the, 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 you know, the opportuni opportunity or the technology to do aqueducts, to do bridges, to do everything. So they created an empire because they could dominate this mass. Hmm? Okay. So what happened after the empire? And they, this, the, the Roman Empire, you have to remember that, was a, a millennium, okay? So what happened after that millennium? We went back to mass, okay? This is Romanesque. And, and you can see there, is, there are absolutely no windows on the left, uh, then a little bit of <laughs> windows on the central picture, and some, you know, some void, some windows on the tower on the, on the, on the third one. But it took 500 years to get to these little windows, okay? Then you got the Gothic where they dominated the interior, the interior void, but still they had very, so it was very tough for them to open holes on the, on the walls because, you know, the structure would collapse. And then you got Antoni Gaudi, you know, which is another disruption because using that geometry, he could have light open any wall, any roof, any part of the building. And that's the real importance of this architect through the technology uh, for construction because he really changed the equation, all right? Usi using the pure compression uh, to the limit. And one of his... But the Gaudi only worked for the happy few again, right? So the Mr. Mila, Mr. Bayo, the, the bishops, but, but not really was affordable, okay? So, then in this, uh, during Gaudi's life, it was a, a real disruption, but now it's a technology, technology disruption. They changed the material. Construction started to use steel. And steel is a different, is a different material that not only works on compression, but also works on tension. You, know, you, you can tension it and it's still working. So, you, then you have a quick story about, the, you know, the Tour Eiffel, which was built in, in Paris, as you, as you know, the Empire State Building and the Guggenheim Museum. This is another century, or a little bit more of a century, and that, th that thing has changed dramatically how now we understand construction. You know, we, we as, as, as Franz said, we have participated on the uh, construction and design of, of the sol technical solutions of the Guggenheim, and I can tell you that the weight of the Guggenheim is less than 10% of the weight of the Tour Eiffel and 100 times less than, the, than the, the Empire State Building. Why? Because we used state-of-the-art technology, okay? Okay, now let's talk about housing. Everyone, when they, you know, when you're talking about, I'm going to buy a house or I want to have a house, uh, everyone is thinking in something like that, dreaming something like that. But this is not affordable, okay? But mentally, when you're talking about, uh, with you know, a guy in India or a guy in Mexico or a guy wherever, he wants his castle. And that's a, it's a fact, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's a real fact. 
People want castles, but castles are not affordable. So what are we going to do? Okay. So let's go to the his real history of housing. That was the first house, affordable. Then, then we moved to those one-story buildings made in local materials, av locally available materials. And this was uh, for, for centuries, you know, used in, in many parts of the world. And then the Romans uh, designed what they called the insulas. And the insulas are four-story buildings, fa multifamily, and no elevator. Okay? And we really think that you know, we have to rethink, as Gaudi said, you know, you, to be original, you have to go back to the origin. And then I think that being, you know, seeing what the Romans did a couple of, you know, just 2,000 years ago, uh, if you compare with the 60,000 from, from, from here, it's very short period of time, we should rethink about what the Romans did again. Hmm? The reality today is this. This is all over the place. I don't even know where I took this picture, but we, 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 you, you can be Sao Paulo, can be Rio, can be Delhi, wherever. It's, it's amazing. The whole world is full of that. And the, the, the population's growth is, is the, all, the, all the, you know, the ratios and all the indicators are saying that we need at least 240 million of homes in the world today. But uh, as the population grows, when we have finished this event, there are more, four more thousand units needed. Every hour is four more thou four thousand units. So this is what today architects are doing. You know, this is north of Mexico. This is not a drawing. This is a real picture. You can see the cars and the doors and everything. This is what we are doing today. And it's not only Mexico. You can you can see it in a lot of countries. This is absolutely insane because it burns land. And this is, has a, a very high infrastructure cost. Very high. You know, even the mailman gets lost, you know. This is another solution. This is the, what the, the Russians did, okay? And this was, as you can see, <laughs> not really friendly, okay? Uh, it's a lot of cement, a lot of concrete here, and, and uh, well, you can get lost very easy as well. So, what is the new generation going to do? This guy is Cesar Martinel the fifth. I am the third. I, I showed you my granddad, but he's my grand. Uh, my, my, how do you say my? Not grandson. He is my uh, godson. <laughs> so I'm his padrino. Okay, and and he hopefully is going to be an architect as well. And we really don't know what he has to do to solve that problem, even to live. Okay. So, let's think about water. Construction is using a lot of, const uh, of water. We evaporate, this is the Sade building, is, uh, I think it's 3,000 square meters, more or less. So in this building, to build this building, we have evaporated one and a half million, one and a half million of water bottles of those, all right? It's, it's unbelievable the amount of water you evaporate in traditional construction. So first thing to understand is, but this was a lake. You can see the signs. That was a lake. And it was no fishing at the, at the hardware. Hey, no more water. So we're really using water for a stupid thing, which is construction. A construction industry spends half of the water that holds the rest of the, so in the total, you know, you, you, you took the water consumption for industry and 50% is construction. So we really should rethink about that as well. Hmm? But let's think about, let's talk about weight now. There are two guys at the left picture and one girl at the right picture. And these guys are moving one quarter of a square meter of wall. And the girl is moving nine square meters. Or, you know, these guys are in a factor of weight is seven times more, but in a factor of productivity is 36 times less, okay? So we should think about weight as well, because lifting weight, it spends or burns a lot of energy. So what we are trying to do in, in, in our firm is, is to go, 
uh, to go for eco architecture instead of ego architecture. Ego architecture is uh, to the left of the picture here. You can see is a one family home in India. Okay, this is a, an Indian billionaire that decided to build his house in the middle of the city, and he could afford it. But this, this is again happy few affordable building. Okay, at the right picture, we have designed um, uh, an affordable, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a prototype for affordable housing. You have 16 units here that you can repeat and repeat and repeat, and it's four story, no elevator, like the Romans. Okay, so for, to, you, know, you know, not to bore you anymore, I would like to do, uh, you know, an experience that I, I hope you will enjoy. Traditional construction is using oopa, two to one, okay, times to hold. You know, we hold 500 sheets of paper here and we use 1,000, correct? But if you use geometry and you use technology a little bit better and you have some prefab things, okay, which shows, then we're going to use four to hold 500. And we'll, let's see what happens. Maybe it holds, maybe it falls, but we will see. Okay? So, magically, we're using less, <laughs> hey, less than 1% to hold the thing. And what's going to happen if we try it again? Okay? It is going to fall. Or not? <laughs> hey, let's do it again. Hey, now it's going to fall. All right. It's not falling. And don't forget the water, because this is also part of the equation. Thank you very much.